Man, let me tell y'all, life has been such a struggle as a new graduate dentist. <sighs> I'm finishing up in my second year, coming into season three now. I have come across so many problems and challenges along the road that I really wanted to talk about today. And if I knew about these problems earlier when I just got out of dental school or when I was in school, I feel like I would have been much more prepared to answer and deal with these problems. Instead, I had to face all these challenges and learn the hard way. And I feel like these problems are definitely not unique to me because when I talk to my homies about these problems, it's very common that we all have the same issues but just different characters and different settings and dentistry has changed so much right we've all witnessing this rise of DSOs you're seeing the job market start to shift a lot of new grads coming into the market there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of job stability doing the type of dentistry that you want to be doing so without further ado let's get right into today's video topic on the top five struggles I have seen as a new graduate dentist and I've listed them in order of importance with the fifth one being the most <laughs> shocking one that I have realized that's been a real struggle to adapt to. All right, the first one is case acceptance. What I have realized is that in dentistry, the dentist is a salesman. I know, has a terrible reputation. The word sales, salesman, I get it, it's, it's bad. However, you need to establish a sense of urgency and an ability to put value towards this treatment. You have to make the patient understand that this is a problem that will get worse and it won't get better and it needs to be addressed by you. Let's face it, nobody likes going to the dentist, especially if they think that it's gonna be expensive, it's gonna be painful, and it's due to their negligence of not taking care of themselves because dentistry can be fixed for the large part with just a toothbrush and a piece of floss for most of the problems but people neglect these things. And to hear that you are not taking care of your health with such little requirements, it's really off-putting. So when I was in a corporate office, they taught me how to sell treatment. Let me explain why before you bash me for talking about sales and selling treatment. Dentistry is a business and there's a cost of acquisition per patient because as long as you provide value to your patient that costs money to come into the business, you are able to turn a profit. And if you are bad at sales or convincing your patients that they need the treatment after have already spending all this money, you will quickly see your managers and your bosses get very upset because you are unable to convert on this. When I was working for Aspen as a new grad dentist, you start to see how much of the numbers come into play. Every new patient exam, the metrics are listed on the whole website for everything you're doing. How many new patients are coming in? What are they coming in for? The time it takes for your new patient exams, the cost of your average treatment plan, the cost of your average treatment plan acceptance. As a new grad who's never been taught how to sell, has never understood the value of urgency when a patient comes in, or is even unable to see bigger, more comprehensive treatment plans, you don't feel confident in your abilities to execute on these treatment plans. And then when you're talking to your patients, it doesn't come across as very convincing. And I've seen this so many times. So I used to see my senior doctor go into the treatment plans with just crazy big D energy, coming in, knowing exactly what the plan is, very convincing, the least amount of words possible, massive treatment plans. Because he's 20 years out, he knew it was gonna work, and I didn't have that as a new grad dentist, so I think it's a really big struggle to get case acceptance and understand treatment planning. While on the topic of case acceptance, understand their wants versus needs as well, patients don't really understand the difference. They're just coming in because they got a problem and they're just trying to fix it. They may want veneers, but they actually need to fix their occlusion first. And to be able to convince them and educate them on why they need that is a really tricky skill to learn and I'm still going through it too. Every day, I'm constantly trying to refine my new patient exam and understanding patient personalities because each personality type requires a different approach to the exam. Some people are anxious. Some people need two or three appointments to finally lock them in on a case acceptance. Then you realize the cost of your treatment plans. And for the average person, these numbers are just astronomical. Like, yeah, like right now I can afford some fillings and maybe a crown, but to start doing 15, $20,000 of treatment plans and presenting it to people is like mind blowing. I, mean, I feel like I can't even afford some of this stuff. So when you realize how expensive the treatment plans you're presenting are, it puts more value into these new patient exams, establishing urgency, cavities, periodontal disease sometimes are not felt 
but cavity for 200 bucks will turn into a $2,000 root canal and crown. Periodontal disease, if not treated with regular prophys initially, can turn into massive SRPs, bone loss, teeth falling out of their mouth, prosthetics. The cost adds up. Initially, I used to think I was capping or exaggerating on patients when I'd be like, that cavity is a really big problem because it actually is. If you don't tell them, that that cavity will get worse, it'll create more problems, be more expensive. People don't care about their teeth as much as you and I do. We go to school for most people, it's just another expense into their already expensive life. So ever since I've established real value and urgency, my treatment plan case acceptance has gone up. Patients are more comfortable and understanding with what I'm presenting. Now, the second struggle I faced as a new grad dentist was my speed. And if you're in dental school, it's all slow motion compared to real world dentistry. Like that that six month period between the last three months of school and the first three months of private practice work is night and day. And I'm not talking about a residency because residency also is like dental school to me where you're not really in the full blown pace of a business that requires you to produce quickly and jump from chair to chair. In school, they gave me a comprehensive exam to do in two to three hours. I would just be asking them a bunch of questions, waiting in line to get a swipe off, chilling, just super chill. And in private practice, I got four chairs lined up. I got numbing in one, filling in the other, extraction in the other one, drilling two implants in the other patient, just bouncing around nonstop. Like, it is crazy to think about how much I do now in my third year compared to what they tried to teach us in school. It's almost laughable that anybody coming out of school is even slightly prepared for the pace of private practice. Maybe my experiences are different because in Fort Myers, I was in the top five practice in the country for a DSO. They had 11 chairs. <laughs> we were doing like 350,000 a month. But I chose to be in that environment because I knew that if I can handle that, I can handle anything in a more calm and controlled setting because my skills are faster. And you realize that if you wanna make money and live that lifestyle that you want, your ability to produce quick and clean, clinically efficient dentistry is really, really important. It's not taught in school, it's taught through experience and practice. So if I can offer you any advice, I would definitely try to take that job that seems too stressful. You will quickly ramp up speed, you will adapt, you know more than you think you do. And in the next couple years, you will thank yourself for putting yourself in these positions. I noticed using bigger burrs would help me a lot. In school, I, I was so fixated on using the 330 burrs, a pear-shaped, tiny little pequeño. That stuff doesn't work in the real world. I'd be sitting there for like 20 minutes just poking at the cavity trying to remove it all. So now, I use a 557 burr, which is a big carbide, it's thick. So when I'm going through the prep, I can use the least amount of movements to kind of remove all the cavity at once and do the least amount of back and forth. Same thing with my crown preps. I don't like to use that green chamfer burr that much anymore, only to really refine the margin when I'm finishing. But initially I'll use a really fat black chamfer to go around the whole tooth, take the occlusion down. And then, because the bulk of the tooth is a lot of uh, removal of enamel. I realized that when I went to bigger burrs, my efficiency went up much more. So technically that's being more aggressive, even when I'm doing an extraction. Now I'm more inclined to split teeth when I'm extracting them or flapping to get better access and, and removing teeth much faster that way. It sounds counterintuitive to be more aggressive, but if it's faster and it's better for the patient to get in and out instead of being there for an hour for a tooth, I'm not saying just drill out teeth completely out of bone, but to understand when you need to take that next step quicker. When I'm doing extractions, 10 seconds, I'm using an instrument, it's not working, I'm switching to the next instrument. I'm not poking, 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 waiting for 10 minutes and then deciding this was never gonna work to begin with. And then when I'm placing implants, if I'm placing four to six implants in an arch, I am making all the initial osteotomies at one time instead of prepping one, widening it, making sure it's good, taking an x-ray. I'm doing them all at the same time, identifying which implants need to go where. So that helps me a lot by doing multiple units at the same time. These are little clinical tips after you've done a lot of these that it makes sense. You need to be able to move faster. If I'm doing a whole arch of implants, the patient can't be there for eight hours. So you have to be cognizant of this stuff. And also when I'm putting brackets and wires on my ortho patients, delegation and being able to lead the team properly is huge. I'm not changing the brackets and wires on my patients. I'm telling my assistants what to do and a lot of times they're just gonna be chilling. You need to give them direction, become a leader so that your office can move much faster. Sometimes you don't wanna overstep 
And a lot of times my assistants are also older than me, so you gotta play that very carefully. And sometimes I get caught in the moment and I say things that are just like a little more like to the point and people get upset. All right, so the next struggle that I faced as a new grad dentist was that I was trying to challenging myself to do more complex procedures. But you don't always have the training and you don't know everything that's gonna happen before you're starting to attempt these procedures. For example, how do you get better at endo or an extraction? If you don't always have somebody there to bail you out, that's a real problem because now us new grad dentists are practicing on our patients. But it is dental practice at the end of the day and it's the only way to grow and learn. No matter if you're taking a course, you're just a general dentist, you're a specialist, you've had countless amounts of repetition. Sometimes you have mentorship, sometimes you don't, but you're still trying things, seeing how you're doing and adapting your strategy as you move forward. Now the problem comes, you want to learn how to place an implant. You take a course, then you're about to place your first implants outside the course and something goes wrong. How do us new grad dentists constantly improve our skill sets when dentistry in itself is so unpredictable? <laughs> Shit goes wrong all the time and you have to know how to audible. Mentorship isn't always there. Sometimes you are in a practice with a senior doctor. Sometimes the doctor is willing to help you. Other times they don't give a shit about you, right? It's corporate or they got their own cases that they got to worry about. I realized really early on that nobody owes you shit. If a senior doctor is in the office, they don't owe it to you to teach you dentistry. I have an older brother, older cousin kind of vibe, and I talk to him about cases all the time. Sometimes he's just like, dude, I'm not your teacher. He's got his own stuff to worry about. Full mouth of veneers, one pops off, keeps popping off. What happens? And that sucks with our job because constantly I'm feeling inadequate. I'm feeling unconfident in my abilities to perform dentistry at a high level. And many times you just don't know what went wrong place six implants in an arch, one fails, it looked to be the best one. Maybe I didn't clean the socket properly, maybe I held the drill and the osteotomy too long. You really don't know until you've done it so many times. And yeah, I guess that's where the need for specialty comes in. Like, ah, oh, well you should have specialized in oral surgery, but it just seems the trend is to be a general dentist. If you are gonna be one, take courses and continually learn that way. And I'm in the process of doing that, but something about CE courses and constantly paying absorbent amounts of money to learn from people that I could read in textbooks, is it doesn't rub me the right way. Like in my first year of practice, I spent 15,000 on an implant course. Placed two implants in the course, and I just felt like my money was wasted. Like a lot of it's in the MISH textbook. I don't know, as a new grad, it's really hard to just dish out all this money for courses, there's so many other expenses in my life. All right, and struggle number four was finding a good job in your first couple years after school. Supposedly school is supposed to help you find good jobs, right? <laughs> like they definitely didn't help me. The moment I set my last payment in, they were like, peace, mother. Who is able to line new grads up with good jobs? This becomes a really big problem because more and more graduates are coming into the workforce and the DSOs are understanding the best way to get new grads to work for them is to come into the schools, give you those free lunch and learns, awesome parties, events to come to. And I know this per firsthand because this worked on me. I was in my D4 year, Aspen was throwing lunch and learns. Oh, all you can eat sushi, come to this pizza event. There's free beer and wine. I'm like, I'm not gonna turn down a good time. So I showed up, got me nice and lit. Next thing you know, they're telling me about dream opportunities to become the dentist that I wanna be. And I'm like, oh shit, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm, I'm open to listening to it now. It's very, very convincing and very manipulative. You have to understand what the DSOs are doing. Their recruiting budgets are in the millions. That recruiter is specifically designed to be put in front of you. You're gonna hear success stories about doctors doing implants, doctors who have mentorship availability for you. These are all the buzzwords that new grads get super horny over. And I know because I was in that position too. <laughs> it becomes very convincing that I decided to move 1200 miles from Manhattan into rural Fort Myers, Florida. I'm a city boy at heart, lived in Manhattan, Lower East Side for years. Now I live in Miami, but I still chose to move to Fort Myers because they put an opportunity in front of me that I could not resist. Now I did my research and it was a great opportunity. I loved that job for what it was, but I feel like most kids who go to these recruiting events and end up signing on to a DSO don't have that same experience. They may sign on to a job that's close to their home. 
They may have only very few options because they're limited in their geography. And that really hurts a lot of new grads because the office is just gonna give you your bare minimum 150K. Maybe you cap out at like 180, but it's not really a great office production wise. And then you get sucked into it for a year or two, your managers and your bosses just start pushing you around to you're fed up and you're out within 12 months. I hear this story all the time. Make no mistake about it, wherever you are, whether you graduate from an Ivy League school or the shittiest school in the country, the job market for a new grad dentist is really hard. After finishing two years of dentistry and entering my third season, I've had five jobs. This is super common. All my friends have been bouncing around from job to job because the moment you jump into corporate and you see how it is, you're quickly already trying to get out of it, trying to find a better opportunity, but you realize that dentists like to eat their young. They'll hire a new grad, they'll work you to the ground for a year or two, and they'll boot you out if you're not keeping up with the pace. Eventually, we all have this dream of owning our own private practice, but being an associate dentist is very stressful and challenging. So in the five jobs I had, two years. First one, Aspen, did it for a year. Great opportunity, DSO, crazy high pace, like I was on roller skates the entire time. Then I decided I wanted to leave Fort Myers, I wanted to move to Miami. So took on a job, two part-time jobs. That's how these big cities work. It's really hard to find full-time work. Both of them, very hard to make it. I had struggles with case acceptance. I had the inability to speak fluent Spanish. A lot of implant surgeries, which I joined an implant company. I wasn't qualified enough, but you know, I just raised, the, <laughs> just raised my boss up and she was like, this is a crazy cool resume. Like I'll give you a job. There was no full-time opportunity still. No daily guarantee. I was losing money. I was showing up. I was unable to produce anything. One of the offices out of the two was fee for service. High quality dentistry being demanded of me. I remember I did like a 19 MO and I put flowable in the filling prep. This is a corporate tendency that obviously is not the best thing to do, but my boss sat me down and was like, you gotta put fill tech in this molar. Are you crazy? Like the filling costs four hundred and eighty dollars for the patient fee for service, North Miami fee. He's like, dude, this thing's gonna break. We don't work like this. Just a still new grad, only out for one year. Working DSO, these tendencies to just fill as quick as possible, moving around. I had to unlearn. So I left those jobs eventually. I just wasn't making money. I had to find new opportunities. Then I found a Medicaid office that was giving me a daily. Took that but wasn't the dentistry that I like to do. I was doing massive fillings on teeth that needed crowns. I would just be doing extractions where people feel pain from cavities and, and just doing removable dentures. It was like pirate dentistry to me, you know? So I didn't wanna be that kind of dentist and I didn't see a future in that. So I was constantly being bounced around, looking for opportunities. And living in a city like this in Miami was brutal to not have any salary. I was burning through all my Fort Myers Aspen money and I was going through a real depression just trying to find a decent job. You think that you graduate school and you're a doctor now, like you got this big D energy, like you can make any amount of money anywhere you are. It doesn't require much effort to get a good job. That's what I thought, I was so wrong. And I learned the hard way. And the next struggle I faced, which I did not expect at all, was being able to obtain good work-life balance. Because I think dentistry is the ultimate work-life balance career. I was sold this dream at a very early age. I had family in dentistry. They work like four days a week, 32 hours, amazing job. And they make bank. But working DSO and working these high volume offices, I realized that I'm a slave to this machine. I have to work so much. I barely get time off. Maybe I am working too much, but I realized that I wasn't making enough money to live the lifestyle that I wanted to if I didn't work this much. I chose Aspen and my owner was making me do 10 hours a day every other Saturday. This doesn't sound like work-life balance that I like. I wasn't even able to go home for Thanksgiving that year because I was forced to work Black Friday. I'm like, this is absurd. So I see this trend of new grads coming into DSOs and you have no choice but to work the hours that these companies demand of you. It's a business and they'll run you to the ground. They'll work you 20 hours a day if they could. If everybody wasn't gonna just quit immediately. So at least at Aspen, I was really struggling trying to find work-life balance. And in Miami, my current job is 12 hours a day 
six days a week. Now, sometimes I do get days off in between. I also live an hour away. My schedule is 14 hours outside of my crib. And for six days a week, it's these are like surgeon home FS residency hours, but I don't get paid like that. It is a dream opportunity for me. I am able to do ortho bracket and wire, place full arch implants, do a lot of veneer cases. So it's worth it for me in the sense that I am learning. I'm, I get to live in Miami with this job. So yeah, sacrifice on work-life balance. However, the goal is eventually to own your own practice, right? I want to live that lifestyle that I was promised at an early age. I do know docs who don't work that much and spend a lot of free time, but they just aren't making that much money. They're okay with that. You'll realize soon in dentistry that many students come in pretty rich and are just looking for a day job to work a few hours a week, marry rich, or just live off family money. It's a flex for a lot of people, but I wanna be able to own a practice, I wanna have businesses, and I need to be ready for all that. So I'm really working hard now, sacrificing a work-life balance, and I think it'll all pay off eventually for me. I'm curious to know what you're thinking. If you have any questions or you feel any type of way about this content, just leave a comment down below. I'll definitely respond, and I'm looking forward to connecting with you. I'll see y'all in the next one.